Thank you very much, Anko. Uh, thank you for inviting me, and uh, thank you everybody for uh, for being here. Uh, this is uh, uh, from uh, research I'm doing for a while. Uh, the first idea about this topic came to me when I was teaching uh, a summer course at uh, Suffolk University in Boston. Uh, there is a chapter. The course is uh, financial services, uh, but uh, there was a chapter on uh, private banking, and I found it interesting. Uh, so you will hear as I talk about it. So it is private banking. It's something private. Uh, usually, the kind of research we do in finance is we collect data and uh, do analysis uh, based on some established models. And then we get the result and arrive at some conclusions. But in this case, as you can imagine from the first word, it is a private. So there is no publicly available data that can systematically be downloaded and analyzed. So I will just uh, talk about some issues related to these banking services uh, and uh, the implications, the consequences, and then uh, what uh, we can conclude from there. Okay? So I have these slides. I will just uh, uh, follow that. So private banking, can you see? Can you see this uh, print? Okay. Private banking is banking services geared to high net worth individuals. Okay. Geared to high net worth individuals means rich people uh, and involves more than just the traditional banking services. So traditional banking services, uh, ordinary people like we go, we deposit our paycheck or any other receipt in a bank write a check on that or withdraw sometimes by using the ATM uh, and uh, basically that is it or a little bit more than that is if they allow you to trade stocks online you can trade but uh, the private banking services I'm talking about here involve all kinds of services estate planning customized investment advising tax planning customized lending the way they want risk management uh, philanthropy trust services family office where you can go have an office in the bank and then have access to access to special uh, databases that other people cannot have vacation planning personal introductions and confidentiality and the last one is actually at the core of the private banking services so uh, it is provided by who it is provided by all kinds of financial institutions commercial banks trust companies, investment banks, insurance companies, and sometimes some companies are established by the clients themselves, uh, uh, like a special purpose entity. And then who are these clients? Clients are, as I said, high net worth individuals, usually considered as uh, people who can discretionary investment of uh, 500,000 or above. But sometimes some banks can uh, get clients with current net worth less than this, but with a good potential prospect in the future. So the bank can actually decide who is high net worth individual, um, not necessarily based on the current income, but based on the prospect. Like for example, if there is a young dentist or a young doctor with good prospect of earning millions in the future, then the banker can approach them and uh, provide the private banking services. But in general, the criteria, you know, it's considered uh, people with high discretionary investments. They can invest at will this amount. Uh, the sources of the wells can be grouped into two, okay? Legitimate and criminal wells, okay? The legitimate wells is like wells from inheritance, uh, like entrepreneurial wells, well, uh, like executives may get their executive stock option. Sometimes so when they have executive stock option, the stock price goes up and they all of a sudden get millions of dollars. So that's another corporate wells. Entrepreneurs, they may sell their business and uh, realize big money. Um, and also like basketball players, movie stars, all of a sudden they may hit a good thing and they get a lot of money. And uh, that all, all that is a legitimate source of wells. And then there are other illegitimate sources of wills, political wills, like people are at uh, government political position and embezzle money. Uh, criminal wills, like by weapons smugglers, drug dealers, human traffickers, 
they get a lot of money and this is criminal wealth okay so now why do these people need private banking because they have a lot of money and they want to preserve the money they got okay that is one and the other is they want to avoid paying tax on this money on this investment okay so like everybody desires confidentiality in financial transactions but especially people who intended to evade tax or people who acquired the wealth by illegitimate means demand confidentiality so there is a demand for confidentiality uh, from these sources and the financial institutions basically supply okay they just meet that demand so it is a matter of demand and supply basic economics uh, highway network individuals uh, with the intent to avoid tax or hide their wealth or or uh, people who acquired wealth by illegitimate means demand confidentiality financial institutions supply confidentiality okay so so, so that is uh, basically where they meet now if the criminal act is the reason behind the demand for confidentiality the high net worth individuals basically uh, put their money on the offshore offshore financial centers okay what is called offshore financial centers these offshore financial centers are jurisdictions like switzerland it doesn't have to be like uh, on an island it, has, it can be like on a mainland uh, jurisdictions like uh, switzerland cayman islands british virgin islands and so on and there are more and more uh, such jurisdictions emerging nowadays and uh, the key thing is they have high level of banking secrecy okay high level of banking secrecy low or no tax very little or no banking supervision no banking regulation uh, and then limited or no transactions between the offshore financial center and the local economies so basically accounts are kept there the money is not really invested there the money is not flowing into into cayman island it is just an account that is passing through there so there are offices kept there basically so little little economic activity between the this uh, offshore financial institutions and the local economy and then tax evasion is not considered a, le a legal offense okay so these are the basic characteristics of these offshore financial centers and so people who got the wells by legal means or who intended to hide the payment of tax on income derived from that wells demand confidentiality and park their money on these offshore financial centers if you have any questions please feel free to uh, you know raise your hand and stop me this is a list of uh, some of the well known offshore financial centers okay so in each uh, you know cook islands djibouti liberia mauritius seychelles in africa and the middle east cook islands guam hong kong okay all those in uh, asia pacific in europe andorra cyprus gibraltar isle of man jersey in Western Hemisphere, uh, Anguilla, Antigua, Aruba, Bahamas, Cayman Islands, Bermuda, okay, all these kind of uh, what, uh, jurisdictions. Okay, uh, here are some uh, stylized facts about these offshore financial centers and other other uh, uh, factors that I'm going to discuss. IMF lists about 63 of them, and there are more and more emerging. 42 of them are low tax jurisdictions. 23 are members of the IMF, 17 are dependent territories of the UK, Netherlands or other former colonial powers, uh, 6 are independent jurisdictions but formerly were UK colonies. So most of the offshore financial centers are located on small islands. Switzerland is a notorious well known located in the middle of Europe. Uh, and also there are some countries like even the United States which has some places where offshore financial centers are uh, located. Like for example, international banking facilities, uh, Japanese offshore markets, London International Financial Centers. These are also uh, these also provide the same services that the offshore financial centers provide, uh, but uh, they can be influenced by the U.S. government and the British government and so on. Uh, they are like uh, centers similar to free trade zone. Okay, free trade zone is a zone where uh, businesses can establish. Uh, manufacturing facilities 
if the intent is to export directly from there and it doesn't come into the main economy. So in that case, you know, they can export, it's to promote export. So these are similar to those uh, when it comes to the US, Japan, UK, okay? Number of banks operating on these offshore centers are increasing from year to year. The Bank for International Settlement in 2004 estimates $2.7 trillion bank deposits in the offshore. Okay, the world total is $14.4 trillion. So this is like about maybe one-fourth, a little less than one-fourth. Boston Consulting Group 2003 estimates uh, of cash and security holdings by high net worth individuals is about 38 trillion. About 9 trillion of those are on the offshore, 24 percent offshore. And in 2004, conservative estimate puts the value of assets offshore at 11 to 12 trillion. Trillion is what? Do you know? Anybody who know what number trillion is? How many zeros? Huh? Five? Nine? Nine or more. A million is with six zeros. Nine, uh, with nine zeros is a billion. Trillion is with 12 zeros. Okay, one and 12 zeros is a trillion. Okay, and the uh, Tax Justice Network 2010 um, estimate puts the figure uh, for high uh, financial wealth at offshores between 21 to 32 trillion. Yes. They estimate systematically different ways. So that is why there is a big range actually in, in terms of the estimate because it is a rough estimate. Okay? And uh, sometimes some information is leaked. Sometimes when you look at the balance of payment of a country, there are statistical discrepancies which are not explained by transactions. The balance of payment is supposed to report uh, in a double entry format. So if there are some flows for which one side is captured, it indicates these kinds of illicit flows or underground economy. So uh, these are estimated from that kind of uh, data. Offshore companies are formed at a rate of 150,000 per year. So most companies are banks, trust investment companies, as I told you earlier, insurance companies, and the special purpose entities of or onshore companies. So like onshore companies establish special purpose entities offshore for record purposes. They borrow in their name, and invest and in their name they hide. Like Google, for example, established offshore uh, what, uh, special purpose entities in Ireland and other non-tax jurisdictions. And then most of the revenue is recognized by these special purpose entities. The costs are recognized in the US. So since there is no tax on those islands, the special purpose entity doesn't pay any tax. And uh, since revenue is not recognized in the US, the company doesn't pay any taxes to the U.S. government. Okay, so that is uh, the purpose of all this. And here is, uh, you know, some other figures for Cayman Islands and British Virgin Islands. <coughs> so as you can see, the population, these are small, small islands. This population, 45,000, 23,000. This is, uh, I think, 2005 or 2004 figures. GDP per capita. Uh, number of offshore companies, 70,000, 700,000, more than the number of people on the island. Uh, and also total offshore assets, 1 trillion, 2.44 billion. Uh, annual license fees, they collect annual license fees like this for, from the companies. Total international assets and international liabilities. As you can see, the assets and the liabilities are almost the same. So it is just a record that is kept there. The net is almost zero. So actually it is a place to just to keep records and hide the transactions. Uh, income tax, none. So this is like a typical feature of uh, these uh, offshore financial centers. Here are other, other uh, uh, more like uh, about four of them. Like we can see the jurisdictional status for Cayman Island, UK dependent territory. British Virgin Island also UK dependent territory. Uh, Switzerland and Cyprus are sovereign states. Here, population, GDP, income, taxation, none. No income tax on this, uh, in these jurisdictions. Uh, you know, other facts. And uh, one other thing which I want to add here is, so these are the figures about what kind of companies are there, mainly. Employees in financial services sector. 
Uh, financial services to GDP ratio, like 14 percent. Here, this one, at least in the case of British Virgin Islands, is large. Otherwise, the contribution of the financial center is very insignificant to the economy of those islands. Okay. Uh, and then here, money laundering rating. This is a money laundering rating from uh, secrecy jurisdiction. Uh, one is non-compliant, no compliant at all. Doesn't comply with money laundering regulations. Four is fully compliant. So when you look at this, they are between complying and uh, you know f non compliant and partial compliant. Okay, so they don't comply with the money laundering regulation. The beneficiaries are high net worth individuals. They hide their money. They get protected. That is what they want: confidentiality. And the other is the jurisdictions collect some taxes. They collect license fees license fees and the registration fees. Private banking clients get confidential service, customized service, introduction, and sometimes vacation planning and other good stuff that other people don't get. Uh, and the companies avoid tax, or individuals also avoid tax. And then banks save on tax, and also they charge high fees. They collect these fees for providing these services. and uh, they can charge high net interest income. The bank is see when they when they borrow from individuals, when we deposit, they offer little interest. If you go to the bank to borrow, they charge high interest. The difference is the net interest income. That is how uh, they do their business. Now, in this case, they have high net interest income because, because the high net worth individuals do not demand high rate of return. What they demand is other services, confidentiality, preservation of capital, okay, and other advisory and uh, other services. So they don't demand high rate of return. So the banks can invest in whatever rate of return they give. They give little high rate of return to the high net worth individuals and they keep the rest. Yes? Um, so these high fees are actually lower than the um, taxes would be, right? The high fees are lower than the taxes? That they would be getting if they were doing this without this kind of um, bank account. The high fees that the banks get? Well, then let me, let, let me ask you this. Mm -hmm. Who's um, being charged with these fees? Say, say it again. Um, who's, being, who's paying these fees? The high net worth individuals. Right. Yeah. So these individuals are obviously getting a profit, or not maybe a profit, but um, are doing better by paying these high fees than paying the taxes that they would be paying. Yes. So um, my assumption is that these fees are lower than the taxes. Obviously, the, the tax yeah. is, you know, the tax is like if you, if you make $100 income, you pay tax on that. If the tax rate is 30%, you pay $30. Right. If the tax rate is 15%, you pay $15. So the tax is based on the income. Now, if the fee, the fee is the income, the tax obviously is less than the income, okay? But the point here is, if you are investing in a market and the market gives a rate of return of, let's say, 10%, but as a high net worth individual, since you are desiring the other services, you will not demand from the bank 10% rate of return. You will demand probably 5%. So the bank will keep the difference, okay? And then they get the 5% and on that they don't pay tax because it is hidden, okay? That, so that is the point here. So they don't demand high tax, they don't demand high fees or high rate of return from the banks, so the banks get to keep a bigger spread. So if that is the case, banks that provide private banking services should be more profitable than regular banks. So it's like a win-win, basically. Between the two, yes. For the private banking, uh, uh, for the clients, and for the banks, financial institutions that provide this service, okay? And who is the loser? Huh? The government. The government doesn't get the tax. And that the government doesn't get the tax means what? We pay more tax to cover the government expenditures, okay? So, so that, is, uh, that is how things are related. Okay, they are interested in confidentiality, capital preservation, okay, capital preservation, so and other trust services, not necessarily 
profit. Okay, I'm saying not necessarily profit. Some may desire profit too, and they want to hide that profit after all. With you know, get a profit without paying tax. So, this is a comparison of a rough comparison of the performance of U.S. banks and the Switzerland banks, and this is based on aggregate index, index of U.S. banks and index of Swiss banks. And uh, this rough comparison, as you can see now, Swiss banks provide private banking services more than the U.S. banks do. Okay, more than the U.S. banks do. It doesn't mean the U.S. banks don't do. They do, but Swiss banks are well known. The country has no uh, has very loose banking supervision. And the country has no tax or very low tax. And uh, the banks are at liberty to provide these private banking services. So based on that assumption, uh, this table shows a comparison of US bank index with the bank, uh, Swiss bank index. So as you can see, this is the average monthly return. For the US, it's 1.3%. For the Swiss banks, it's almost 1.7% rate of return per month. When you analyze it, 16% for the US, almost 22% for the Swiss banks. Okay, so they make more, and it is consistent with what I what I said earlier, and uh, this is a standard deviation which measures volatility, volatility in their performance, and the volatility of the Swiss banks is high. Okay, the volatility of the Swiss banks is relatively high, means they are operating in a more risky environment, and uh, then these are measured like uh, CV is coefficient of variation when you divide the volatility by the rate of average monthly rate of return or annual rate of return volatility divided by the rate of return so it measures the risk per unit of return so when you measure the risk per unit of return there is no big difference between the two when you just look at the return the swiss banks are definitely making more money than the u.s banks but when you measure based on uh, risk adjusted if you will uh, basis the swiss banks are better off Okay, and that is because they are providing private banking services, so it is profitable. Okay, from the bank's point of view. But this is a graphical presentation of the same. So the red one is Swiss bank index, and uh, the blue one is the U.S. banking index. You see, some years the U.S. banking index surpasses the Swiss bank in performance, but most of the time it is the Swiss bank that perform better. And this data is not clean because. Some of the U.S. banks also offer private banking services, and some of the Swiss banks operate in the U.S. also. So it is difficult to really get a clean data to test or to do analysis and interpret in this topic area. The, uh, no, so they get the money, they earn high profit. What is the problem? Rich people get to hide their money, avoid tax. What is the problem? The problem is with the onshore. Criminal Corrupt government officials, drug dealers, weapon smugglers, terrorists, human traffickers, all expropriate wells, hide and engage in money laundering by using these offshore financial centers. That is a problem. Onshore jurisdictions lose tax revenue. Onshore jurisdictions, especially emerging economies, lose capital investment too. So like uh, the government officials, when they loot from the emerging countries, the poor countries in Africa, Asia, Latin America, they put the money away. And that money is not invested in those countries. But in the case of the US and other uh, developed countries, the money at least goes back indirectly. Because it is only in these countries that uh, sophisticated financial instruments exist. Different kinds of investment opportunities, instruments to hide the money exist in the developed countries. In emerging market countries, those don't exist. So the looters loot the money, and the money never gets back, uh, never get back in, for investment in those economies. In the case of the developed countries, the money at least, even if it is laundered and the tax is avoided, records are kept on the offshore, the money can come back and get invested in the economy. So the emerging market countries get to lose. It is double loss. Exceptions are recently, there is what is called round trip investment in the BRIC countries. Brazil, Russia, India, China, Spain, or South Africa. Three countries, um, the round trip investment is like this. The government officials loot the money, embezzle the money, and they put on the islands, offshore. Okay? They put offshore, 
and establish special purpose entities there. And then, since they are still in power, they are still government officials, what do they do? They invite those special purpose entities, basically their own companies, to invest in the natural resources of their countries. Okay? So, like Russian officials, take the money out, establish special purpose entities on Cyprus, and then those special purpose entities come back to Russia and invest in mining and other natural resource uh, areas. That is a round trip investment. Uh, it also is facilitated through these um, offshore financial centers. And then the other result is political and economic instability in those countries where there is more corruption. So this is just a depiction of the money flows from different countries to offshore. But uh, when it comes to the, uh, you know, the continent, Africa, Asia, the money doesn't go back. It never goes back because it goes out and it doesn't get back uh, for investment. There are no investment opportunities or no sophisticated financial instruments through which they can hide. And this is the mechanics of money laundering. First, dirty money ill-gotten by criminal acts or whatever uh, is shipped offshore through with the help of the financial institutions. And on the offshore, the banks make interbank transfer from one country to the other if necessary. They buy securities, they buy art, gold, and then transfer those onshore and sell it onshore, like art, Mona Lisa picture. You buy in some other country and bring and sell here. So you can sell, so it becomes clean money now. And you can use it. So that is just one uh, way of uh, depicting. Tax evasion or tax avoidance. What is the difference between tax evasion and tax avoidance? Does anybody know about tax evasion or tax avoidance? Or is there any difference? Huh? The same, huh? Uh, it sounds the same, basically. You know, literally the meaning should be the same, but uh, it is defined in such a way that tax avoidance is uh, mean, uh, reducing your tax liability by using legal means. Okay? Like, for example, you can postpone. Businesses can calculate depreciation by different methods and postpone. There are all kinds of tax deductible items, and you can use those and reduce your tax liability. Those are legal means. Tax evasion is illegal. That is completely avoiding paying tax. For example, intentionally reporting, under-reporting income or overstating expenses so that the amount of tax you have to pay to the government is reduced. Okay? So that is illegal means. So how do people avoid the tax or, uh, or evade the tax? Not remitting the profit onshore. Like in the case of the United States, the law is like this. At, at the moment, if you earn income in a foreign country, you don't pay tax on that income unless you bring it home. Okay? So if you keep it there, you don't have to pay tax to the U.S. government. It is the year you bring it in that you pay. So by keeping it offshore completely, then companies or individuals avoid paying tax. And the other is establishing special purpose entities, like independent subsidiaries on the offshore financial centers and using transfer pricing mechanisms to avoid tax. Like, for example, if there is a company A, say in Connecticut, company A will go to Cayman Islands and establish a special purpose entity, company B. So company A will sell its products to company B or transfer its products to company B. Company B finishes and then sells. So if the price, the selling price is, say, $20, the cost at which the company A f uh, processes the product in Connecticut is, say, $10. And when it sells it for $20, it should have recognized a profit of $10 and paid tax on that $10 profit per unit. But instead, what it will do? It will simply ship the goods at no profit in the U.S., such that all the profit is recognized by the special purpose entity offshore. And no profit is recognized in the U.S. Okay? So if it is cost is $10, it will sell at $10, zero profit in the US. The uh, special purpose entity will sell it for $20, its cost is $10, it can recognize $10 profit, 
and it doesn't pay tax because in the offshore there is no tax. And then it doesn't bring the money home and just keeps it there and invest in other countries. So that is uh, a price uh, transfer pricing mechanism of avoiding tax. Okay? Most countries tax income earned abroad when it is brought home. And also, even if, it is, uh, if the foreign country taxes, the U.S. tax law allows you to get a tax credit on, on the tax paid to foreign jurisdictions. Okay, so basically, people talk about, in finance, people talk about uh, profitable tax arbitrage. But uh, if you really look at it seriously, there is no profitable tax arbitrage. If you follow the law, unless you really bend the law, unless you misrepresent some things, there is no profitable tax arbitrage. You can postpone, but you can't completely avoid. Okay? This is an example of transfer pricing, like here. Say company A produces and sells tools that cost 1,000 and sell for 1,500. So it should report a profit of 500. If the tax rate is, say, 30%, 150 is the tax. But company A can establish special purpose entity, say company X on British Virgin Islands, so the tax rate is zero. So company A sells the tools to X at 1,050 instead of 1,500. And so here it will simply recognize 50 profit and pay tax of 15. X will recognize profit of 450 and pay no tax. Okay, so the tax that should be 150 will become 15. It can become zero even. Okay, that is transfer pricing mechanism. So that is uh, one way. And like you see example, Enron had 3,500 network of special purpose entities on the different islands, Cayman Island and other places. And here are other, uh, other figures. McKinley in the company estimates in 2003 uh, assets held offshore at 11 to 12 trillion. Like if the rate of return on such investment is modestly about 7.5%, it means 860 billion in profit. And if the tax rate is 30%, it is about 255 billion tax revenue that the onshore loses. And uh, there is a, a recent uh, uh, report uh, which put the figure actually at 472.5 billion, or from here to here, uh, from 472.5 to 720 billion, the tax that is lost. The previous estimate is based on like 2003 figures. This is based on 2010 figures. So it is actually almost double, okay? Double that amount, more, a lot of money is lost a lot of tax revenue that legitimately belong to the onshore government is lost. And as you can uh, imagine, as you know, the onshore governments are running on budget deficits and uh, too much debt. Tax avoidance in the UK alone, like in 2004, from 25 to 85 billion pounds. Okay? And uh, all other uh, figures. Tax havens, the offshore jurisdictions, contain about 1.2 percent of world population, 3 percent of world GDP, 26 percent of assets, 31 percent of profits of U.S. multinational companies. Okay. So, and then here are some other figures from uh, emerging market countries. Africa leaders had 20 billion in Swiss bank accounts in 1999. That is twice the amount that the sub-Saharan African countries pay on debt servicing. Like the interest they have to pay on the money they, borrow, they borrowed is half that much. But the amount of money that the leaders have on Swiss bank account is about 20 billion. Baby Dog Duvalier of Haiti, Mobutu of Zaire, Abacha of Nigeria, Raul Salinas of Mexico embezzled from their countries. Under Abacha, 15 million a day used to go to his bank account in, Swiss, in Switzerland. 15 million from oil. Nigeria is rich in oil, so the oil export money is diverted to his bank account at a rate of 15 million per day. Ben Ali of Tunisia, that was hosted in 2011, had 11 billion pounds in his Swiss bank account. And the new government was trying to recover that. But other estimates put his wealth at around 47 billion uh, pounds. Okay? So money lost by developing countries is likely never to return back. Okay, so the guy is overthrown, he ran away, he may get back, he may get his money because it's offshore, but the country loses. So, uh, 
these are uh, things, and then this corruption, embezzlement of money, and uh, cause instability onshore in many emerging market countries, uh, and also poverty resulting from expropriation of wealth and exporting criminal wealth, sometimes finances, political campaigns, and of course political instability. Now the question is what should be done? Like this is uh, the Costco club, Costco uh, connection. The magazine has a Costco connection magazine and they uh, did a survey this past summer uh, asking people, should offshore bank accounts be taxable? What do you think? How many of you say the offshore bank accounts should be taxable? How many of you say they should not be taxed? You didn't understand what I'm talking about so far. <laughs> okay? So the answer, you see? The answer, 50% yes. 50% no. <laughs> okay? 50% said yes, they should be taxed. 50% said no, they should not be taxed. And they all gave different reasons. Okay? Now, what do the offshore, uh, the, the offshore want? Confidentiality and getting all these fees. And the financial institutions want to continue that. What do the onshore want? The onshore want, sorry, the onshore want transparency. Transparency. Now, the other thing I did not uh, emphasize is, like uh, in, in the United States or in other all countries, there is banking regulation. Banking regulation is for stability of the financial systems. Okay? Sometimes there are tight regulations, sometimes loose regulations. One of uh, the banking regulations is uh, capital adequacy. A bank should have adequate capital. So like out of the total assets the bank has, it should have a capital of say 10%. Okay? Now, how could the regulators implement that regulation? How could they enforce? If some of the money is hidden on the offshore, some of the bank's assets and the liabilities are hidden offshore, it is difficult for the regulators to enforce banking regulation. And that causes instability, economic instability onshore. That is another, another thing. So because of that, the onshore jurisdictions want transparency, and that is opposite of confidentiality. So this is uh, the, the source of the conflict right there. The offshores resist transparency. So under pressure, especially from the US and the Western Europeans since the uh, 2001 terrorist attack, under big pressure, some of the offshore jurisdictions started yielding. And so, in most cases, they do bilateral negotiations instead of, uh, you know, across the board uniform r rules. So, some of them yielded to disclose private banking information when criminal activity is suspected. You know, and then tax evasion is not a criminal offense on those islands. So, when you say here is a criminal offense, and if it is tax evasion, it is not in their books. So, still there are problems. The EU passed a savings tax directive in which they required the offshore jurisdictions either to submit the list of individuals with investment accounts on their, uh, in their jurisdiction or simply remit 15% of the savings income without disclosing the identity of the individuals. Okay? And some of the islands complied since July 2005. And, then, and uh, then in the United States also, the U.S. provided all kinds of legal reg new acts, new regulations, uh, and uh, some of them are being implemented. So, based on these regulations, uh, so the U.S. demand is to one, transparency, and the other is allow banks that operate in the U.S., uh, the, the banks that operate in the U.S., like especially foreign banks, they must be subject to consolidated supervision. Consolidated supervision is the bank is supervised based on its global assets, not just based on the assets and the liabilities located in one country. So if uh, an island or any other jurisdiction follows this consolidated supervision of financial institutions, then they can operate in the United States. Otherwise, those banks cannot operate in the United States. And the other is the U.S., similar to the European uh, Savings Tax Directive, demanded either the disclosure of the customers or 30% tax remittance to the U.S. government based on those accounts. And then 
they prosecuted some financial institutions as well as individuals that did not comply with those. Okay? These measures reduce illegal transfers of money and money laundering, but they are less likely to affect the developing countries' corruption because the U.S. doesn't extend its jurisdiction to emerging market countries unless its own interest is uh, uh, at risk. Uh, so the number of companies and the volume of funds flowing to the offshore jurisdictions kept increasing. And uh, also like other countries like in the, in the Arab Middle East started uh, these um, offshore, offshore financial centers. And especially it is troublesome because they follow Islamic banking, not uh, as transparent as others. Okay? But whatever these new regulations, new acts, the effectiveness, even in the case of developed countries, depends on the determination of the law enforcement in these countries, in the U.S. Like if their complicity is the main thing which uh, allowed offshore jurisdictions to mess around even in the past. Okay? Uh, here are some of the uh, news about uh, the enforcement. Okay? Liberty Reserve accused of biggest money laundering and is... Liberty Reserve is a financial institution established in Costa Rica and that's fake, but uh, others are using to transfer money. Uh, FBI is not Silk Road boss with own methods. This is also a money laundering uh, group. Uh, billionaires flee havens as trillions pursued like uh, uh, as a result of this enforcement. One other thing is because the U.S. demanded the financial, the offshore financial institutions to submit 30% of the income or disclose the identity of the individuals and the persecuted the financial institutions that did not comply. So some of the financial institutions in the offshore started refusing U.S. clients. Okay? And then as a result, some U.S. citizens started abandoning their citizenship, changing their citizenship instead of paying the tax and the coming to the U.S. There are these kinds of things in the news. Okay? So, um, you know, others like uh, UBS, Union Bank of Switzerland, was prosecuted and uh, agreed to disclose the identity of 52,000 Americans with uh, secret accounts. It actually disclosed 4,450 of them and agreed to pay a penalty of $780 million. Okay? So, it goes on prosecution. What further can be done? The U.S. and other developed countries should continue prosecuting uh, uh, individuals as well as the financial institutions that aid in the tax evasion, money laundering, and all kinds of financial crimes. Uh, so they should keep pressure. They should keep pressure on the offshore for greater transparency. And the other thing is to aid in the case of the emerging market countries there should be an institution similar to the International Criminal Court to prosecute these kinds of crimes and also to allow the return of the funds looted from the emerging market countries back to the country from where it is looted so that they can at least recover um, you know, what is uh, taken away from them illegally. Any question? So that is uh, basically my talk. If you have any question, please feel free to ask. Yes. Yeah, I do have a question. Okay, so let's say I won the lotto tomorrow, and I decided to, you know, take all this money and put it in an offshore bank. Um, could that bank just like keep that money? Like, if you know, just like they could dissolve and you know keep that money, and would I have any recourse? Yeah, of course. Uh, it is, uh, you know, you you have an account with them. Uh, they are, you are their client, this is their business. So they don't want to lose the business and their reputation. They keep the money for you and uh, handle it for you the way you want it. But I mean, if they were unethical, could they, you know, just abscond with that money? And could they steal it? I think that's what you mean. Yeah. Yeah, I understand what you mean. But if they do, definitely when you give the money, you don't just give. So you have to have some uh, evidence for yourself that you gave them the money. If you're cautious, everything yeah. will be okay. So that confidentiality is between you, the banker, and, uh, and uh, only God knows. <laughs> only God knows. Yeah, actually that is uh, the phrase. Only the banker, the client, and the God know.
the, the, the transaction. It, the accounts are there with codes. You have to have your own evidence if they deny you. Yes. The government, like for example, if the client is from Germany, then they have to remit the 15% to on the on government of Germany. So it's based on the governments of the people who have money in the Yes, bank. yeah. Okay. The, the client country. Any other? Yes. Like I, I talked earlier, the money laundering, they can, you know, bring for you in different ways. They can buy jewelry, uh, for example, Taiko executive salute like that. And then whenever his wife, the executive's wife went abroad, she got all kinds of gifts uh, and brought back in the form of those gifts, like jewelry, work of art, and so on. And then you sell those here in the user money. Well, that is one example I'm aware of. Uh, the other is uh, sometimes they can buy complex securities like derivatives and then, um, uh, you know, sell that here and give you. Um, yes. Trying to sell art and jewelry here, although, yes, it'll work, it seems really slow. It seems like that might not happen too quickly at all. You mean it takes time? Yeah. Yeah, I could. Yes. But you're not doing it, you, you said in the beginning, you're not necessarily doing it to generate income. You're doing it to avoid taxes and to be, make those other services available. Yes, so you avoid tax and you preserve, hide your capital, if especially if it is right. it's not illegal. Yeah. Income yeah. But what he's saying is you want the money. So right. if you want to transfer it in the form of work of art, it's difficult to, to sell it. It may take time. Right. So in that case, you know, the other alternatives, the financial instruments, complex securities can be used. So those accounts, they're mostly individuals? Or could company, could like a U.S. company have an offshore account? Like in Companies too. Companies especially establish special purpose entities, okay, through which they recognize revenue there mm -hmm. and uh, only cost here, okay, like Google did, for example. And uh, with that respect to the U.S. has a new regulation in which it said the foreign special purpose entity must have like a significant portion of the operation. Like it must have uh, say a certain percent, uh, 40 percent or so of the total employees of the company must be there. Okay, so they are demanding that there be real operation, real physical operation on tho uh, in those uh, special purpose entities. That is to minimize, you know, the impact of uh, using transfer me uh, pricing mechanism to avoid tax. Thank you very much, Dr. Thank you. Thank you.